They're a lot bigger. Relative to this crow, they stand again this high. They've got a wingspan of four, four and a half feet. Huge bill, very deep, croaking voice, very different flight style, more soaring and rapid flapping than a crow, and uh, making all sorts of weird sounds. Anything you might hear in the forest, I'm sure you have heard them. If you don't know what it is, that's the best guess as to what it, what it was. <laughs> or a stellar shape, which is a member of the same family. These guys are all members of the family of birds known as the corvids or the corvidae. And uh, you see the raven up on top, that's the, that's the largest songbird in the world. This is a group of songbirds, even though they don't sing a lot. They have complex throat muscles that allow them to make a variety of noises. And uh, they thrill us with those noises often. But this group includes the jays, the Stellar's jay shown there in the middle, some of the magpie jays there from uh, South America, Central America. And then magpies, which you're familiar with on the east side of our, our mountains around here, and Clark's nutcrackers, gray jays, or Canada jay. Uh, a lot of those species are in the same group, and they share high intelligence, permanent monogamy, and uh, a diversity of social structures. So these guys have influenced us for a long time. This drawing is uh, a representation Tony did from a... Uh, cave art from Lascaux, France is estimated to be 30,000 years old. And what it shows, at least is what it's been suggested it shows, is the soul of a hunter after he's been killed by this bison, perhaps that he didn't quite kill the first shot on the first shot, then killed him, and he is uh, in the process of raising up into uh, heaven in this case, or their belief of that. And the head of this man is what's interesting. It's shaped like a raven's bill. It's not curved down like an eagle. It's not long like a heron or something like that. It's shaped like a, a crow or a raven's head. And it's not surprising that the artist might render it like that because what would he see or she see as she came upon this fallen friend in the forest but probably a group of ravens or maybe crows flying up from it. And so a lot of the mythology we've had, European mythology, has been around these animals as being carriers of our souls or, or carriers of messages from the living to the dead because they're often associated with dead people as well as other animals which they scavenge upon as one of their prime food sources. And as you know around here, their influence in the Native American culture, Native uh, people's culture has, is incredibly strong. Bill Reed's uh, fantastic carving of a, um, the Haida myth of how the first people were discovered by Raven and released from a clamshell to populate the earth. I just went and saw that uh, incredible sculpture again today. I hadn't seen it for 20 years or so, and it's just fantastic, huge thing, and I'm sure you've, you've all seen it as well. So they've been a powerful influence on people. In one aspect, they influence us to dream about them, to, to have our religions revolve around them. On the other hand, uh, people go out of their way to shoot them and hunt them because they're challenging. They're, they're very wary. They're difficult to get close to and sneak up on and shoot. And so there's a whole culture of crow hunting that has developed, and it's legal at least in the United States. I'm not sure here, but it's legal to shoot crows. I guess there's something about how you line them up after you shoot them that he's showing here, I don't know, but there is a culture of this hunting, much like duck hunting, where there's um, you know camouflage used, there's industries around particular guns that are used to shoot, crows quietly at a long distance, crow collars to, to lure them in, and a whole set of um, perhaps fancy protocols that people do after they, they shoot them that are associated with this culture of hunting. And, and they don't typically eat them either. So this influence, positive, negative, multifaceted, has been long-lasting. And that's what Tony has drawn here, is just a bit of a timeline of how these animals have influenced and interacted with people over the millennia. And so we have, starting down here, some of the interactions with, the, with first peoples. And uh, I've talked a bit about those. You know much about those here. Uh, but they've influenced us in Europe, uh, Odin, uh, the Norse god has shown up there in the top left. He was informed by Ravens Daily about his world, much as the shamans of the Northwest were informed about theirs. Very similar uh, relationships and interactions with him. Asian artists on the right-hand side have drawn uh, fabulous renditions of crows and ravens and really celebrated the family uh, notion of these birds in their paintings and the, the social aspects of them in their paintings quite often. 
We dealt with them on battlefields. We had to build scarecrows into the, to the drying racks of salmon uh, for people around here to keep them from stealing their fish, although they were also worshiping them as a creator. They were a pest as well at that time. The Tower of London uh, still maintains ravens because of the belief that if they ever leave uh, England, the kingdom will fall. But I don't think somebody told them the kingdom had already fallen. But uh, they still got the ravens just in, just in case. And even in modern times, these animals have influenced us and continue to influence us dramatically. We have the Baltimore Ravens football team, the Counting Crows rock band, Alfred Hitchcock movies. Lots of different ways these animals continue to inform our, and influence our um, popular culture and language to this day. So because of this influence, we started thinking maybe there's something more to this than just a, a one-way uh, response of us to this interesting animal. Maybe we also have a response and an influence on them that, that changes their culture. I mean, not that they have the sort of fancy culture that we have, but they do have socially learned uh, traditions, and those are passed on in a way that would allow traditions to develop and evolve in an animal society. And that's how many biologists and, and some anthropologists define culture in animals as a socially learned tradition. It's passed on uh, from observation or, or um, even perhaps instruction from one animal to the next and copying of that. So what we mean here is that perhaps their social learned tra traditions might also inform our socially passed on traditions and back and forth much in the way that a flower and a hummingbird influence one another in a standard genetic coevolution, we think the same thing might be happening in this more socially evolved, socially learned uh, traditions. So we're interested in seeing that. And, and the example that's shown here of this is of orca and harbor seals. And uh, as, as you probably know, in our part of the world, Oftentimes, the orca and the uh, harbor seal have a strongly co-evolved behavior relationship. In our case, in Puget Sound, uh, the harbor seals there don't respond to orca when they come in because the orca there are primarily salmon-eating orca. And occasionally, that co-evolved behavioral relationship is broken. When vagrant uh, orca come in, they don't eat just um, salmon, but they tend to, to like uh, harbor seals. And they're pretty easy to catch when the harbor seals all are thinking perhaps that uh, these are orca that are eating salmon, but they're not. So at, at a few years ago, a, a bunch of these vagrant orca came in and ate about half of the harbor seal population in the Puget Sound, suggesting that this sort of behavior relation between the other ones was fairly tight, and in this case, easy to take advantage of. So we think that might be happening with, with people and crows and ravens in many ways. And I'm not going to go into all of these, don't worry. But I thought I would just mention, we think it's a fairly uh, large component. We have a pretty good feel for how these animals have influenced our culture. You know, I mentioned some examples of it in that timeline, but just think of the words in our English language, at least, that are derived from crow or raven. You, you'll come up with more that are associated with that species, crow or raven, than with any other wild animal, at least that we could find. So you've got perhaps uh, crow's feet on your face. You perhaps you know, used a crowbar to pry something off. Or maybe uh, you had something to crow about after eating crow mistakenly. So there are a variety of ways these animals and their influences have creeped into our language. And uh, we, we think that the other uh, direction may also have been possible with us influencing them. In terms of our uh, early hunting and gathering, we provided a lot of opportunity for scavenging and learning to how to deal with us for these animals. Agriculture. I'll give you some examples there where we've influenced their distribution and perhaps their migratory behavior, perhaps socially learned. Uh, we've influenced them with our feeding and, and our shooting of them and our urbanization, as I alluded to initially. What I'd like to say just up front, though, is that while we have a pretty good idea of how they've influenced our culture, it's very difficult to show how we've influenced theirs. Because again, in what I mean by culture is a socially learned socially passed on tradition in an animal society. I'll show you some examples of where I think we can show that in our, in our work and some other people's work, but it's a difficult thing to show. So a lot of this is still hypothesis, and I'll just leave it at that. One example 
of what we believe is a socially learned behavior is the, is the mobbing behavior of crows and ravens and how that has been changed by their interaction with us, our culture of persecution, basically. So this was work done a while ago by Rick Knight and his colleagues, and what they found is that if they'd climb up to a raven or a crow nest in an urban area, the birds were very aggressive, stooping down and scolding at them, trying to harass them away from the nest. But if they did that in a rural area, agricultural setting, that was not the case. The birds would quickly and silently slip away. And the reason for that is because of our culture being very different in those settings. For policies and safety reasons, we don't shoot birds very often in urban settings. So they're perhaps more aggressive because of that. In, a, in another setting where they're pests and our crops, we shoot them. And they tend to know that and avoid us.